Well, hey guys, we've reached the end of the year in Written Theory 1. And just take a moment to look back and think about how much you've learned this year. You really understand a lot of the basics of diatonic harmony right now. You know a couple of things about chromatic harmony because you know how to modulate to like the dominant with the rule of the octave when we plus six on the law. We'll talk more about chromaticism in the fall and continue to build your skills. For your summer project, I've asked you to read uh, quite a few chapters in the Stone textbook. And I want to just talk a little bit about different perspectives on the concept of harmony and different pedagogical traditions that exist in the, in the music theory universe. And so just a little bit of, this is a very rough sketch of, of the history of theory, but let's go to the, web, to the whiteboard here and just kind of talk through some of these things. So what it comes down to is that we have been taking in my class an old uh, approach called partimento. Partimento. I'm going to write that down here because a lot of this originates in Italy. Uh, Bob Gerdingen just wrote a fantastic book about child composers and how they were trained. And there were these uh, conservatorios, uh, conservatorios in Italy, which were actually, if you believe in that, orphanages. And the orphanage, orphans would learn music and they learned sight singing, solfeggio. They, they learned these harmonic exercises that we've been working on, partimento, which were improvised, by the way. And then they would build upon them and, and do written uh, counterpoint and, and get really complex and the fugues and stuff like that. It was really cool. And it was a living tradition. They didn't really publish this stuff. It kind of existed in their notebooks and, and, and you know, about in the last couple of decades now. Not even two decades, under two decades, as I say this in 2020 people have gone through the libraries of Europe and they have found all of these manuscript notebooks, the student notebooks of these great Italian masters of Partimento, and they've reconstructed and, and brought them up. And I, I understand that in parts of Europe, this tradition continued. It was living. We lost it in the United States, but it, it's how people like Mozart learned, people like Haydn learned. It, it's, it's how to speak the language of music. It's why we've been working on this. Now, on the other hand, let's just trace some things of influence. Over here in France, we have a guy named Jean-Philippe Rameau. And about 1725, he writes the, this treatise on harmony. And this is where he comes up with the idea that the, it, you don't have a separate chord of the fifth and a chord of the sixth, but that they are inversions of the same chord because they have the same notes in the when you aggregate everything together, they're the same notes, just in a different order. It's something different in the bass. Anyway, he comes up with a theory of harmony based on that. And, and we're going to trace the influence of both of these traditions and see why you need to learn all, all those Roman numerals and inversions in the first place and why I start with partimento. So... Partimento practice spreads to different places. So Partimento comes up to Germany, because of course Germany is sitting here in between you know, France, Italy, all the, kind of the three major European countries, right? Partimento kind of spreads up here, and, and this is what we call practice. This is what the practicing musicians learn in Germany, and you'll find traces of Partimento in so many treatises, including by Bach's contemporaries. For that matter, Adek Remus is reconstructing Bach's pedagogy, and a lot of it ties into the Partimento tradition. And, and so it's this living, living tradition. And this is how you actually compose music. In the meantime, Romo's theories have also spread over to Germany. But where they have gone into is they have gone into the universities. And the universities in places like Vienna um, are teaching this as a theory of music. They're, they're proposing that this might be how music works and really digging into the math and science of things. And not so much actual practical matters. How do I actually write music? How do I 
actually improvise music. It's, it's more of a dry academic approach up here. Now the interesting thing is that Partimento actually comes over to France as well. And you kind of get this fusing of Rameau, Rameelian theory plus Partimento theory at the French Conservatory. which is founded by Luigi Cherubini, who is, of course, Italian. And so the Partimento practice comes over into France uh, because Rameau was French and, French and Rameau published. That's why I think Rameau's theory became so influential and the Partimento practice kind of didn't become as influential. I think it's largely because of the published. I think that's also why the universities picked up on it because it was, it was pseudoscientific and it was published and, and it was deep and mysterious and the things that academics like, right? Yeah. But the French Conservatory, you can trace the line down from Cherubini to Nadia Boulanger, and she taught pretty much anyone in the 20th century who people actually pay money to listen to nowadays. And so there's this living tradition of Partimento, even in France. I, I have here, this is one of Boulanger's students, Narcisse Bonnet, and you can see it includes uh, some stuff from Nadie Boulanger, and it's her concept on harmony. It's really cool. It's it's a fusing of inversions with partimento practice, and so they start with five three chords, then six three chords, and add in the different types of chords. But there are theories that come in that that resemble more the way we've talked about harmony this year. That's not pure Rommelian. It's really fascinating, and and as I continue to explore and learn the French uh, conservatory stuff, I'm want to work it into my class as well. Uh, my, my philosophy is if I teach anything the same way twice, that's my time to retire because I haven't learned anything in the past year if that happens. Good model for you to follow. Continuing education, right? So, in the meantime, however, let's, let's come over here. We had left off with the Rommelian theory in the universities here. And of course, when you know the Nazis are on rise to power, a lot of Germans immigrate a lot of your German academicians especially, immigrate to America. Schoenberg comes over. Schoenberg is absolutely brilliant as a theorist. Um, Sechter. I should have mentioned his name. Sechter is the guy who comes up with the idea of putting Roman numerals on everything because he has something called a scale step theory, which is to say it's not the base that determines the harmony, but the scale degree of the root of the chord, the imaginary root, whatever scale degree it is, uh, that determines the harmonic function. And this becomes the standard American approach to harmony with Roman numerals and inversions and so on and so forth. And it's not really a living tradition. You don't really learn how to speak the music. Um, There's this fantastic uh, article that was written about Rousseau trying to learn how to compose from Rameau's book and terribly frustrated because he can't figure out how it works. It's, it's the difference between learning how to ride a bicycle versus learning the mechanics of how a bicycle works. And I've been trying to teach you guys how to ride the bicycle approach to music, how music actually, you know, how you use it and how you create it, and how you improvise and how you speak the language. And the other stuff is kind of speculative theory. And if you become a theorist, well then, you know, then it's worth knowing all this stuff. It's, it's great to be aware of the tradition of centuries, even millennia of musical thought. It, it, it is fun. It's why I became a theorist. I, I really geek out about the stuff I do. But for you guys, most of you, you know, you're gonna be teachers, uh, you're gonna be performers. You're gonna to need to know kind of the practical living tradition approach. And that's what I've been trying to give you. And I'm going to try to work some Bach pedagogy in as I've learned about that from Derek Remes and work in some of the French Conservatory and, of course, the Italian Partimento that we've been working with. And so this this circle, oh, I guess that's showing because my mouse was down too far. This living circle here of living tradition. And this is why jazz. I'll include France here, French Conservatory. 
This is why jazz musicians still improvise, because they followed the living tradition, not the, the speculative tradition, the dead tradition, which I'll outline in red now. Humo, Secter, and the American pedagogical system of music theory. This is speculative. And this is practice practical. Anyway, I'm asking you to read over the summer some chapters in the Stone textbook, Music Theory and Composition, A Practical Approach. Um, by the way, those, yeah, I showed the video talking about the Eichmann. I, I'm sure I did, just in case you do, didn't see it. This is the other textbook I use in my th theory class, the, the main textbook here. Love this. That's a good approach to the kind of learn the Partimento style. The Stone is an excellent textbook, I think, for learning the uh, speculative Roman numeral style. I think you'll find that having learned Partimento, it will most be a review to you and just a different perspective on things you already know. Uh, it will bounce off nicely on what you've learned in oral theory because the textbook author there is following the Rimmelian, uh sectarian American uh, pedagogical tradition. You're going to transfer somewhere else in America presumably where you're going to need to know this stuff and so it's good to be aware of it. One of the things I like about Stone is that he recognizes when he's talking in his figure base chapter that figure base means more than just inversions of chords which, which we've learned. We've learned how the different figures mean things that the chords have to go somewhere and we've learned a living tradition. Anyway, just a little bit of an introduction there, a historical summary of very broad strokes of kind of two main pedagogical traditions, theory versus practice. And if you have any questions over the summer as you're reading, you can always contact me. You know, I'm on Facebook. Feel free to friends me if you haven't. Uh, shoot me messages, uh, feel free to email me at bakercaspercollege.edu, and I'm always happy to talk with theory with anybody. I, I love I love theory, I love music, I love understanding this stuff, I love talking about it with people. So we'll see you in the fall.